Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. We have opportunity to open God's Word together now, and as many of you know, perhaps if you're visiting us today, you may not be aware, but in this season of Lent, we're going through a sermon series called The Upside Down Way of Jesus. We called that way the cross-shaped life, or more theologically, the cruciform life. And... That way of life, in many ways, is captured by paradoxes. Paradoxes are those things that are seemingly contradictory, but true. And when we began, we noticed perhaps a kind of overarching paradox for the Christian life that can be described in this way. For the Christian, the way up is the way down. The way up is the way down. And we're looking at this upside-down way of life as we journey in this season of Lent to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. First, we considered the upside-down way of spiritual growth. Remember, the way to become mature is to become like little children. Or, secondly, the way towards obedience. Being a slave of Jesus actually frees us to flourish. And today, the upside-down way of what we might call effectiveness or a life of fruitfulness. We all want to have lives that, that have meaning, that impact, lives that make a difference in our world. And today, we learn that it is in small deeds of love that significant change and impact and fruitfulness is experienced. So, this theme that we're looking at this morning is a theme actually that we can find in a variety of places in the scripture. And this morning, we're going to be looking at two passages in particular, but several others which these passages actually evoke. And you're going to hear that as we go through them together. So the first text that I'd like to read with us is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, verse 20, where Jesus says to his disciples after they ask him why they were unable to cast out a demon from a young boy, Jesus replies and says, because you have so little faith, I tell you truly, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. As I mentioned, this was Jesus' way of responding to his disciples when they were perplexed by why they were unable to cast a demon out from a young boy. The man's father then brought that boy to Jesus, and Jesus simply cast out the demon. And the disciples asked him, why weren't we able to do that? And Jesus says, because you lack faith. Now, it's worth pausing there for a moment because... The disciples ask the question, why weren't we able to do this? And Jesus talks about their faith. And it's important for us to realize that whenever the Bible speaks about faith, it's really speaking about doing, about living out. Faith in the Bible isn't just about ideas in our head, believing certain statements or facts to be true. Faith is... a a way of life, a way of life that comes from understanding things about God, about our world, and about ourselves. So you could say that when Jesus is addressing the disciples, he's really speaking about how it is that we're invited to live. 
it's not a stretch at all to say that Jesus may have responded, if you have acts of love as small as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And in a way, that's the paradox we're looking at this morning. In small deeds lies great love. Now, I want to share something about this particular saying of Jesus. It's kind of unusual, you know. Why would Jesus speak about moving mountains with small faith or what we might say even small acts of, of love that come from faith? Why would Jesus use this unusual kind of comparison? Well, there's a tradition that accompanies this saying of Jesus, and I want to say it is a tradition. It, it's, the Bible itself doesn't teach us that Jesus was making this reference or evoking this historical incident, but there is a tradition that suggests perhaps Jesus was doing that, and it goes like this. When Jesus says, with faith as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move, and it will move. Perhaps Jesus was evoking something that actually took place about 40 years before Jesus' teaching ministry. King Herod the Great, as many of you might know, was a great builder, right? He built Masada, he built the Caesarea Maris, the city of Caesarea on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. He also built for himself a most luxurious palace called the Herodium. This palace is located on a hilltop just outside of modern-day Bethlehem. And the story behind this palace is that it was constructed on an artificial mountain. Herod recruited thousands of slaves to literally move dirt from an adjacent hillside and build up a larger mountain on top of which he would put his most beautiful palace. In fact, this is a picture of that hilltop which I took when I was in Israel a few years back. You can see it in the distance. It's located next to another hill that's considerably lower. The hilltop that Herod had built was an artificial mountain, if you will, where he could sit his palace on top and from that height overlook the region of Judea as far away as Jerusalem itself. So, is it possible that Jesus, when he says this saying to his disciples, is evoking a memory or a reality that they would have all been familiar with? This king about 40 years ago, Herod the Great, the one who tried to kill Jesus by, by putting all those young children to death in Bethlehem when he was born. That king, that great builder, he, he literally moved a mountain to construct his palace. Jesus is saying with, with faith, with acts of love, small deeds of love, you are able to move mountains. You can change the world, we might imagine Jesus saying. Now, did you notice the tree in the foreground of this image? That's actually a mustard tree. It's about 16 feet tall, quite a large bush. And the seed from which that tree came is that little tiny one on the fingertip of this hand. We saw some of those seeds when we were standing in front of that bush. So Jesus isn't explicitly referring to the Herodium, the palace, which would have been present in Jesus' day. It was built about 20 years before Jesus was born. But is it possible that Jesus is intending to evoke that memory in the minds of his disciples when he shares that? Saying, Herod quite literally moved a mountain with all those slaves, but I tell you, with small deeds of love that comes from faith, you're able to change the world. 
I think that that would be an interesting tradition and maybe quite frankly it's what Jesus was intending to evoke. As I said, the Bible doesn't teach us that explicitly, but a historian by the name of Josephus, who was current in Jesus's time, wrote about that very mountain being constructed artificially upon which Herod built his palace. So quite possibly that would have been in the mind of Jesus's disciples. Now, I want to draw our attention to another part of Matthew's gospel where he's also talking about a mustard seed. And you're going to see why I'm stringing all these things together. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus shares this parable. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field, though it is the smallest of all seeds. When it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. So when Matthew records Jesus in chapter 17, talking about a mustard seed, Matthew is also inviting us to think about what he said in chapter 13. He wants us to hold these pictures in our mind of a tiny seed, a large tree, where the birds of the air nest in its branches. Why is that significant? Well, it, that's significant because it evokes this image from Ezekiel. And Ezekiel speaks about the kingdom of God growing and expanding in such a way and he compares it to that kingdom being like a tree where all the birds of the sky nest in its boughs and all the animals of the wild give birth under its branches all the great nations lived in its shade so what Matthew's doing is he is evoking as he listens to Jesus share this teaching Matthew, as he captures it for us, evokes Ezekiel and says that the very tree that these small seeds give rise to, the very faith that moves mountains, is the kind of faith that finally will impact all the nations of the world. That's Ezekiel. All the nations of the world will be touched by this kingdom that flows into the world through small acts of faith expressed in ordinary lives. Do you see how that so beautifully connects together and gives us a window into this upside down way of Jesus? Where you and I expressing in these ordinary ways deeds of love and quite literally the world is impacted by it listen to this quote from William Barclay he's a, a, a commentator of another era as he quotes um, this particular gentleman I don't know him Hugh Martin quoting H.G. Wells we know that novelist writing War of the Worlds but listen to what William Barclay says about Jesus and keep that in mind as we just heard about this teaching of a tiny mustard seed. Hugh Martin quotes H.G. Wells as saying, His is easily the dominant figure in history. A historian without any theological bias whatever should find that he simply cannot portray the progress of humanity honestly, without giving a foremost place to a penniless teacher from Nazareth. Yes, indeed. In fact, in this parable about the mustard seed, Jesus is saying to his disciples and to his followers today, that's us, that there must be no discouragement, that they must serve and witness each in his place, that each one must be the small beginning from which the kingdom grows until the kingdoms of the earth finally become the kingdom of God. Isn't that a beautiful way of capturing, sorry, the way in which your and my ordinary small deeds of love done from faith impact the world? 
it is no exaggeration to say the most important figure in human history that has effected the most change in human culture is Jesus. Every historian worth their salt will say that. And that's exactly what Jesus taught us when he said, faith as small as a mustard seed, these ordinary acts of love will change the world. We realize in Jesus' life, we're shifting gears now to another passage. In Jesus' life, there was no person too small or too ordinary or too insignificant for him. You could say that his life was attracted to the least, the lost, the disadvantaged. One writer says that when you look at the people that Jesus healed, it's like a who's who of the most insignificant people. At one point, he heals the daughter of a Canaanite woman. And for Jews, Canaanites were people to be avoided. In fact, Jesus' disciples tried to tell him, tell that woman, get away from here. Don't bother the teacher. And Jesus, of course, responds to her and, and heals her son. Jesus healed lepers. He healed those who were paralyzed. He healed the mute, the blind, the demon-possessed. He healed Gentiles. He healed the servant of a centurion. Again, someone that Jews would have avoided. He even healed the son of a widow, raising, her from the, raising him from the dead. To the average person, these were trivial people, unclean people. People at the bottom of society, but yet Jesus cared for all of them. In fact, at one point in his own ministry, just shortly before his crucifixion, Jesus receives a, a small but very sacrificial act of kindness expressed to him. And when his disciples look at that that expression of sacrifice to Jesus they think it's a complete waste but listen to how Jesus responds this is the second passage while Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table when the disciples saw this they were indignant why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price, the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world... What she has done will also be told in memory of her. And now, 2,000 years later, as this preacher is preaching, we're talking about that woman, just as Jesus said we would. It's really a fascinating story. We could say a number of things about it, but I want to draw our attention really just to two simple things. First, the reaction of Jesus' disciples. Why this waste? This is worth a lot of money. We could have helped a lot of people, Jesus, had we just sold that perfume as is. And I suspect there's a good number of us who could relate to that, right? We could do so much more than what this accomplishes. Part of me understands the disciples. One example, I should buy my wife flowers much more than I do. I do buy flowers for her, but probably not often enough. My wife loves flowers, but for this practically minded engineer, you know, they're going to die in about a week. <laughs> Let's do something else with that 30 bucks or whatever a bouquet of flowers costs. 
if you were to give me flowers, I would be, well, a very nice gesture, but I'd much rather have a little case of drill bits or something than flowers. You know, I can understand the disciples. Why this waste? And if you think about the world in which we live in, listen to what my friend Peter Sherman writes. He actually writes about this particular paradox. He says, in our idolatrous, bigger is always better world, we need to discipline ourselves to see God's kingdom in small things. Small is beautiful, wrote Schumacher in a critique of our economy of persistent growth. God is in the small kindnesses, the details, the inconspicuous, even the unlikely. Mother Teresa's quote is apt. Not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. Think about the ways in which you and I organize our lives and think about how a text like this invites us to do those small things those seemingly maybe even useless things for the sake of other people to show kindness to show compassion to show thoughtfulness to show love in a story that i read this week a writer by the name of cecil northcott shares an experience where he was meeting with a group of young people from various places in the world, kind of an international students gathering, a meeting. And as they were talking, they were sharing together ways in which they could evangelize. How is evangelism most effective in the region where you're from or where you're from? They talked about, you know, disseminating literature, sharing books or tracts. And at one point, uh, a woman from Africa who lived in a very small village, she said, when we want to take Christianity to one of our villages, she said, we don't send them books. We take a Christian family and send them to live in that village and they make the village Christian by living there. They live their ordinary lives, lives where their faith is rooted in Jesus Christ, and out of those ordinary lives, they begin influencing and impacting people with the love of Christ. We all know those kinds of people. They often are doing things, so to speak, in the background. There was a woman in my previous congregation, an elderly woman. When I got there, she was probably in her late 70s. By the time I left, she would have been closer to her late 80s. She was quite frail, couldn't do a whole lot physically. But everybody in our congregation knew Gertie because she wrote cards, notes, encouragement to everybody. Just behind, just for sometimes seemingly no reason, a little note, a little card, a word of encouragement. Our congregation was saturated with notes from Gertie. She loved to write, she wrote well, and she loved to shower people with encouragement. This past week, on 6th Street, just uh, over a few blocks over, I happened to see a pizza shop. It's this one here. Maybe some of you know it. L and R or LR Pizza and Curry Limited. And on right next to the door, you can see a little white piece of paper right next to the door. That little piece of paper says this. I don't know if you can read it, but let me read it for you. It says, if you are hungry but don't have money, let us know and we will feed you for free. You know, you don't see that too often. But here is a shop owner who happens to be a Christian, I found out, who believes that part of what he can do in the community is help those who are hungry by giving them some food. 
most people will never see or know or hear about that shop owner, and I think he wants it that way. (laughs) But by God's grace, he touches the lives of a various number of people who need some food. In a sense, the death of Jesus himself was very ordinary, very common. No one would expect to see anybody great hanging on a cross. He was just a criminal being punished along with all the other criminals that got hung on a cross under the authority of Rome. But Jesus submitted himself to that way, believing deeply in his spirit, the words that John says in chapter 12, unless a kernel of wheat, unless a seed be buried in the ground, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus went to the cross believing that to be absolutely true. His life would become life for all who would believe in him. John Stott wrote a very good book on the cross of Christ. If you haven't read it, it's a very fine book. And I want to take an extended quote from that book. And listen to how he captures for us the death of Jesus Christ, the cross of Christ. He says, any contemporary observer who saw Christ die would have listened with astonished incredulity to the claim that the crucified was a conqueror. Nobody crucified on a cross could be a conqueror. Had he not been rejected by his own nation, betrayed, denied, and deserted by his own disciples, and executed by authority from the Roman procurator? Yes. Look at him there, spread eagled and skewered on his cross, robbed of all freedom of movement, strung up with nails, pinned there and powerless. It appears to be total defeat. If there is a victory, it's the victory of pride, prejudice, jealousy, hatred, cowardice, and brutality. Yet the Christian claim is that the reality is the opposite of the appearance. What looks like, and indeed was, the defeat of goodness by evil is also and more certainly the defeat of evil by goodness. Overcome there, he was himself overcoming. Crushed by the ruthless power of Rome, he was himself crushing the serpent's head. The victim was the victor, and the cross is still the throne from which he rules the world. And my friends, that's where we find our life. On a cross. Through the death of Jesus Christ and his defeat of death in his resurrection. That's our source of life. That's why the way up is down. We have to die to sin. We have to unite ourselves with the crucified one and in him find life. And as you and I unite ourselves to Jesus, it's his way that guides our steps. The ordinary way. Jesus extending himself to the least and the last and the lost quite literally changed the world. And you and I, As we take small steps of serving Christ's kingdom, however you might do that, this week, think about small, ordinary ways. Maybe it's in your workplace. That's your prime mission station, is in your workplace. And you're called to be salt and light there. 
Maybe it's in your school community if you're a student. Maybe it's in your neighborhood. Where is God calling you to offer small acts of love, ordinary acts of kindness and compassion, acts that are really like mustard seeds <laughs> that God will use to grow a great tree, a kingdom where eventually all the nations of the world find a place. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, together we say, Amen. Amen.